would just like to introduce uh, Jeremy Hopkins. Um, Jeremy's from the UK and he's going to be talking to us about um, integrating um, managed learning environment uh, around Moodle. And I think, you know, as you say, Jeremy, with these um, um, responses that we've got, Moodle's used in a whole number of different varieties of ways um, and obviously needs to integrate with a, a variety of systems. So I think this is going to be an interesting um, presentation. So without further ado, I'll um, hand over to you. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. So as I think you already know, my name is Jeremy Hopkins. As it says here, I'm the Emily VLE Support Manager and that's a role within CICT at Birmingham, University, Birmingham City University, sorry. So as I already touched on, this presentation hopefully will be of interest to more experienced Moodlers, but also perhaps people starting out wondering how, you know, how they can set Moodle up and thinking about planning what they're going to do. Um, I won't be using desktop sharing in this presentation, but there are pre-recorded videos of some of the walkthroughs on the iMoot Moodle course, which you can see here. And there are some other links throughout this um, presentation, which you should be able to click. If you do that, um, I would suggest you open them in a new tab. Um, they should open in a new tab anyway, but if it's me, I would right click um, so that you don't jump out of the big blue button clicking on these links, but I think that will be okay. A little bit about myself and Moodle at Birmingham City University. It was essentially piloted on a redundant server in an academics office around 2003. Um, so they ran some trials with that and in 2004 they decided they wanted to use it and it was put onto a, a pair of mirrored servers which were kind of on a failover pair by CICT. And I joined the university in 2007 specifically to work on Moodle at that time. Um, but over the years, it's kind of grown as we've added more systems. I should add, I actually studied a degree part-time at the university before I worked here. So I also had a, some recent experience of uh, being a, a part-time student and relying quite heavily on the sort of web-based stuff that was available at that time. So start by sort of asking or answering what is an MLE um, and the reason I put this slide in is because the terms VLE, LME and LMS are often used interchangeably but there is a quite a big distinction. I think VLE and LMS are kind of interchangeable but MLE isn't. So Moodle is a VLE, a virtual learning environment or a LMS learning management system. But for us, Moodle is a central application in our managed learning environment, which also includes something called Course Portal. It does have a, a, a name, but we'll call it a Course Portal for now. Um, a content repository, content creation tools, Mahara, which some of you may already be using. If you're not, you should take a look at that. That's really good. Kaltura, which is um, an open source um, video transcoding and hosting service, which is also very useful. Big Blue Button, which we're using now, and some lecture capture uh, systems as well. So just adding more applications doesn't really give you an MLE. Combining different applications it extends your learning environment, but it's really workflows and processes that give you the management layer. And that's something we've really lacked and, and struggled with until fairly recently. Just to sort of give you an idea of how this came about, this is a very old screenshot of Moodle in around 2004. The university went under a different name at that time, which is why it's a different logo on it. And this is what we've got in 2014 and this is Moodle in the middle here and you can see there's quite a lot of other stuff built around that and the sort of key bit about it being a managed learning environment is that we've got this link up here which is essentially our student record system that you can see feeding into Moodle here 
and this document there is a link to the PDF of that if this isn't very clear that link would show you a clearer diagram of that so for us Moodle grew or very much organically it was put in as an experiment um, and it just went from there really and I've included a, a snippet that I found a while back from a very old um, sort of newsletter that was created around Moodle at that time and this is uh, these are the comments of an, an academic who was involved very early on with it saying that the great thing about Moodle is that it doesn't push users in any particular direction a lot of software tries to say to me this is what you need to do and Moodle says what do you need to do and I really believe that's been the strength of Moodle and I think that's you know again just shown here today or tonight by the, the fact that you know, it's quite the people in this session are using it in quite diverse environments and that was I think really the reason that academics took to it because they could do what they needed to do with it and students liked Moodle as well and so the use of Moodle its adoption within the university increased and it's increased every year for 10 years and it's still <coughs> increasing now every year we surpass the previous year in terms of the amount of activity amount of traffic and transactions that run through our system um, and this has caused some problems along the way so organic growth and organic growing pains so this here is just a little screenshot of our stats a month or so back and we get around 13,000 unique visits a day 105,000 page views per day um, and as I mentioned this grows this has been going up every year and the other problem we have is that the busiest time of year is October shortly after new students enroll so as well as it going up there are kind of spikes along the way if you can kind of see what I've drawn there not particularly clear and these have tended to catch us out in the past um, because it's very difficult for us to predict this sort of growth in demand because it's organic and sometimes you know a particular part of the university will have a big push on something and things can change quite quickly and different times of year lead to sort of different kinds of activity authentication was a problem for us as we started adding more systems because users had to keep every time they followed a link from Moodle into another system they had to log in to something else and to something else and that was a nuisance and LDAP wasn't actually that reliable so we would quite regularly get support tickets coming through from people who were having difficulty logging in through that process it was only a, as a percentage very small but when you've got 20,000 students you only need a small percentage to sort of generate you know enough sort of dissatisfied users as it were or, or for us generate your support tickets which were taking up time the other thing was that content was essentially unmanaged it's very much locked into a Moodle course um, Moodle 2 is a lot better at reusing files and trying to maintain a single copy of a file but content does remain very much locked into a given Moodle course which means that other people can't reuse it who might be doing similar things and quite often people forget where they've put something and will upload it again so the, the content and the file management side of it was also became an increasing problem um, the hardest one to solve was this the kind of unstructured courses and by that I mean they weren't in line with the student record system the reality is they they probably well they were in line with the student record system but only because it made sense for lecturers to create courses that sort of matched the modules they were teaching there was no structure to it um, there was no requirement to do that and there was no way for us to map Moodle courses onto the records in the student record system so there's no way to map um, a module as it's known in the student record system to its corresponding Moodle course um, unless it was done manually which we knew would never work so a consequence of that is that enrollments were error prone because all the enrollments are handled manually in Moodle it might be CSV upload or 
Electra might just send out an email or may use an enrolment key. Um, I think I mentioned CSV upload. So from a student's perspective, they're enrolling in different ways on different courses, which doesn't make sense to them. And worst of all, if somebody sets the date incorrectly, then students or indeed teaching staff get kicked out of the course partway through the semester, which isn't good either. The other issues are that we can't get grades out of the system, um, and we still can't at the moment, but we're going to work on that. And that's a problem because we want to move towards 100% e-submission, that being online submission through Moodle. Um, so that is something else we really need to work on. And we had no way to clear down old courses because we couldn't really, without knowing what they related to, you can't automatically go deleting things in Moodle. And similarly, we can't delete <coughs> old assignments, which is a problem because when we move to this, I would estimate around 85% of our storage space will be assignment files if we don't do something about this. Um, so this is going to be a growing problem for us going forward. Just a little bit more on the kind of expansion of our system. Um, this, I think, was written in around January, I think, maybe December of 2013. And he looked at the previous 12 months at that time, which was that 95,000 quizzes were taken with a million quiz questions, 5,000 questionnaires, 54,000 forum posts, which are quite impressive numbers. We were quite pleased with that. But when you consider we've got 20,000 students, that's actually less than three forum posts per student per year. Um, and again, I, I said that Moodle usage is growing year on year on year and still growing after 10 years. And if you compare this to the number of uh, students we have, then clearly there's scope for this to get much, much bigger than it is now. So I mentioned performance issues. This is essentially the kind of initial setup that was put together when CICT first started formally supporting Moodle which was a failover pair of servers. These are both physical servers. They're replicated. If this one goes down, this one takes over. So it's high availability. But they can't handle you know, increase, increased demand or spikes in demand. Because the only way you can scale this up is to take these servers out and put bigger ones in. And that costs money. And you've got to replace the entire server. There's a lead time for getting those things ordered and delivered and installed. And this is really where a lot of our performance issues came from not being able to react quickly. This is what we have now. Um, and in fact, this changed recently. I'll, I'll come on to that in a second. Um, essentially, we've got load balancers on Moodle. We've got five web servers, which are all virtualized. Moodle.org, last time I read, don't recommend you use virtual servers. But all of our infrastructure is virtualized, so that's what we used. And it has worked pretty well. And this means if demand increases, we can plug another virtual machine in here, which brings me on to this. So this is Mahara. This, these are Moodle. This is Mahara. This was drawn fairly recently with um, two web front ends for Mahara. There's actually three now, because we plugged another one in um, a few weeks back. So that's really made a big difference to us, the fact that we've got, we can quite easily expand this. This is our repository, again, with, I think that's our repository, yes it is, with um, two web front ends. This is Kaltura, which we use for our video hosting. This here, which is our storage, is actually on a storage area network, so there's a whole load of infrastructure behind these orange boxes here, which aren't really represented on this diagram. But if we need more storage, then we can increase that. And uh, we've got a lot of storage available, should we need it. The only bit that's not scalable at the moment are the MySQL databases, which are still on physical servers. But they're multi-cored servers. They're running well under capacity, but really want to move to a cluster at some point so that we have this kind of more pluggable solution on the database side as well. Particularly as we, I don't know if any of you saw 
Tim Hunt's presentation on online exams using Moodle, which is something we've been kind of following. So Tim put auto save into the quiz module. I don't know if any of you have seen that. But essentially, if you're taking a quiz, it will auto save every minute so that if there's a problem with the browser, you don't lose all the work in the middle of an exam or you don't submit the page after writing your answers and lose it. Now, if you start doing that on a large scale, that means you've got lots of machines, auto-saving, that kind of thing puts more load on the database. So that's really the next thing that we'll be looking at, and quite specifically in relation to online exams. If you haven't watched Tim Hunt's presentation on that, the, um, it's well worth going and have a look at the recording of that. So, sorry, I'm just reading Teresa's comments here. Yeah, I mean, as Teresa says, the quiz autosave is a core feature that now can be turned on. It might be off by default, but we will definitely be turning that on because people have used quiz for online exams, and that's been growing. Um, and this is in spite of it being a less than reliable process. So if you can imagine somebody completes a page in a quiz, they get to the end of that quiz and hit submit and their internet connection is gone. They can lose all their work and that's caused a lot of upset. So at the moment what staff do and will continue to is sort of have a fallback. They'll still have paper copies so if Moodle goes down they can fall back on that. Um, but I think when when we turn this on, when we turn auto save on, we expect that it to be used a lot more. People who've used quiz for exams in the past and had the fingers burned will come back to it and you really see that will start to grow. So, yeah, I mean, it's, there's no need to apologize, Theresa. I think this is actually, I wish I'd incorporated this into the presentation, really, because it's a really good example of how things change in Moodle and within an organization and why having this kind of expandable infrastructure is important. So what we're talking about now is a new feature that's come along in Moodle which I believe will influence the way our staff use Moodle and will put more load on this and we need to be able to respond to that. So it's actually, you know, I don't think it's that much of a, a digression, but we'll leave it at that for now. So the other issue I mentioned earlier on was authentication between different systems and we've got a single sign-on system. So if you go to Moodle, this is our repository and authoring tool. Mahara, which hopefully some of you will recognize. This is our university portal, SharePoint, Outlook. Any of these that you visit and more, there are other applications that use this. You will always be sent to this page to log in. If you visit Moodle, you'll be sent here. And this is where you log in and then you'll be sent back to Moodle. But once you've logged in here, if you want to go from Moodle to Mahara, it will automatically log you in. Now, you can kind of do that anyway through MNET, but say you could jump from Moodle to Webmail, so this would be OWA, the sort of web version of Outlook or SharePoint or our portal, or indeed you could log in here first and then jump to Moodle and it will log you straight in. So that's made a big difference in terms of being able to move around systems, and it's also proved more reliable than LDAP. We did actually have a problem with this um, earlier in the year and briefly turned it off and went back to LDAP. And, and really, that was kind of a real eye-opener, having to go back from this to LDAP, having used this for a couple of years, just realized how much of an improvement it was and how unhappy students were even having to use this for a couple of hours. Um, it really sort of brought home the value of having this. And we've also got a mobile app, which one of my colleagues has been developing. Um, with some Moodle integration on that. But this also hooks into single sign-on. It doesn't use the web-based form, but this hooks into the same. If you imagine there's something else that sits behind this form, hooks into that. So it's pretty seamless. It works quite well. And there's a short video on that here if you just want to see how that actually works. The other part of that, really, um, is something that Again, my colleagues have been working on, which are calling the common design language. So as you move between these applications, being able to sign into them automatically is a massive step forward. But then if they all look different and things are in different places, it's harder, particularly for students who've just joined the university, to find out where everything is. 
and in fact I had some feedback from a student earlier today saying oh they weren't very happy with the kind of navigation around the different systems they said it's difficult to difficult to navigate around things um, so this kind of trying to get this consistency across all applications which is kind of outlined here is something else we've been working on now Moodle is very constrained really if you've ever worked on a Moodle theme you'll know that the essentially the course content is put out by one variable you can't easily change layouts but the th one of the things you have got a lot of control over is the header for example and this is a screenshot of our Moodle header and also our um, university sort of portal which we call iCity you'll see they're very similar and this toolbar across the top here is actually a, a part of single sign-on almost it's a centrally provided um, navigation bar which is why it's identical between the two and if we mouse over these sort of go to links here then we get this kind of tiled menu that allows us to jump between ICT and Moodle and some of the other applications so within Moodle I can mouse over this click on email it will take me straight into webmail and log me in and these here are alerts telling me that how many unread emails I've got pending calendar events students I think get information on their printer credits library returns and as we integrate Moodle more closely um, start to add assignment deadlines or you know upcoming assignment deadlines in there there's not going to be too much going in there because it will get too busy but you know um, again this kind of thing becomes possible once you're running through single sign-on one bit that does differ between these is this navigation here so when we call this which is written in jQuery we just embed it into Moodle or other applications when we call this script we can define our own navigation so the navigation in Moodle has the things that you would expect so your profile my Moodle there's a link there that will jump you out to Mahara and this navigation is different to that which you would see in the university portal now our single sign-on system was developed internally and so we couldn't share that with you but I know that it was based on SAML and if this is something you're interested in then there is actually a Moodle plugin um, for simple SAML which is an open source PHP um, application which can act as it says here as a service provider or an identity provider and so you can actually um, find open source alternatives to the thing that, that we've built I haven't tested this I don't know how well it works but if nothing else it should give you a really good starting point it's certainly worth investigating if you're interested in single sign-on so the other thing was managing content and this is what we've got at the moment in terms of managing content we've got a repository here um, you may have noticed things like Alfresco and Aquila in the repository settings if you go into, into Moodle's admin section and you go into plugins manage repositories you'll see a couple of well quite a list but Alfresco and Aquila are the close probably the closest to the to what we're using at the moment and as this diagram tries to illustrate we've got multiple Moodle systems and we've got a content authoring tool which is online and so users can upload files into Moodle through a Moodle plugin and the content ends up in this repository that same content be images or videos or documents can be pulled back down into other Moodle systems and in fact you can upload SCORM or IMS packages in here and pull those down and Moodle will install them um, the other thing is Kaltura open source video this has been a massive step forward for us we had a lot of problems with people uploading WMV files, .mov files, MP4s and then not knowing how to embed them we couldn't get them to play in different browsers then iPads came along which made it much worse um, so what Kaltura does it 
when you upload a video to Kaltura, it'll actually transcode it and convert it into different formats. So if somebody uploads a um, WMV file, Kaltura will convert it into MP4. We convert it into two MP4 profiles, one for iOS and one for everything else. And we haven't, although that side of it's working in Kaltura, there's a bit of a problem with the script at the moment. So we've they're not actually playing on iPads as they should at the moment, so we've got to fix that by the end of next week. But the idea is, it, you know, staff can upload any video they want. This will convert it into a playable format. They can embed them very easily, and they'll play on any any device. Um, so I'm just looking. Yeah, I think Teresa said you wanted to look at Kaltura. Um, and it is very useful. It has one of the things that's really made a, a big big difference to us. We self-host this, so Kaltura.org, it's an open source product. Um, you can get it as a service. It's, it seems fairly expensive if you use the sort of Kaltura service, but we use the self-hosted version and it it's works well for us. So, sorry, what to mean by Moodle? Oh, this Explore. Yeah, well, this is actually a product called Intralibrary. I'll come on to that in a, in a second. Yeah, Teresa, um, like I say, Kaltura is expensive if you buy it as a service. Um, if you've got somebody who knows a bit about Linux, you can get this up and running. If you haven't, you could always try and hire somebody to help you set it up. The only problems we've had with Kaltura are when people upload lots of large videos back to back. Sometimes the transcoding gets stuck and one of our administrators has to give it a kick. But it's, it's, that is trivial compared to the problems it's solved. I mean, we had so many problems with video before putting that in. So how this Explore repository works in Moodle, it integrates through the file picker. So this is a commercial product um, called Intralibrary, who developed um, these plugins for it. It's similar to Aquila, which is also commercial. Um, but essentially, when you go into the file picker, you can search for existing files or videos, um, or you can upload new resources and embed them straight away. So again, when you upload a video through Moodle, what happens is the metadata is put in here. So that's the name of the, the title, description of the video, and you can put it into a category. So all that information is here, but the video file itself goes to Kaltura. If you go into Moodle and you choose one of these, if this was a video, so some of these look like they might have been. Yeah, so this is a video. If you were to select that one in Moodle, <coughs> what Intralibrary would give you back is the Kaltura link. So the two systems work quite well together. And this is really, you know, how we want to sort of try and work, really, which is that creating content is very time consuming and expensive. Um, and lecturers don't have necessarily have that much time to create it, or teachers for that matter. So if somebody's invested a lot of time in creating something, then it makes sense to try and get the most value back from that. And you don't do that by locking it into a Moodle course where nobody else can discover or reuse it or, or potentially contribute back to it. So this idea of having the same content shared between different applications, the applications that we've integrated so far are these three, Moodle, the repository itself, which sits in the middle, and an authoring tool. So this is the view. What, what this is showing actually is a, a series of videos uploaded by a lecturer. So he made um, a series of tutorials for his students to help with practical sessions. So I'm searching in Moodle for a term that I, it's a software application called Maya. So I went into Moodle, searched for Maya, got these videos back. The same term in the repository doesn't give you the thumbnails in this particular view, but this is the same list of videos. And then this is an authoring tool, which can be used to build content packages, showing the same files. And it's really this idea that you can upload things from Moodle and then reuse them here, save them back to here. 
use them somewhere else in Moodle later on. But that, that's kind of the idea behind it all. And this is a view of the authoring tool. So documents, as I just explained, documents and images uploaded through Moodle can be pulled out into an authoring tool and create something like an IMS package um, using this software, which was on GitHub for a while. I'm not sure what they're going to do with this. I'm hoping that they'll release the code for this um, at some point. I keep trying to convince them to do that. Um, but there are other authoring tools that this kind of same philosophy could work with. And as I mentioned, the content packages themselves can be exported back into Moodle. And these images would refer back to the repository. So this content package becomes almost a collection of links back to resources in the repository, which makes them very lightweight, um, essentially little more than XML. So David's asked if Explore is part of Kaltura or a separate add-on. It's a separate application, completely separate application. This is the interface for it. It's a repository system called Intralibrary. Um, Kaltura is purely a video transcoding service, so they, they're completely separate applications which we've tied together um, through their respective APIs. So what a, I won't skip back again. Kaltura has a really extensive set of APIs. In fact, one of the features of this authoring tool is that you can embed a video, and through Kaltura APIs, you can play that video and then set the content to change in line with that video. I think that's actually shown on Vimeo. There's a, an old video on Vimeo that a, a colleague put up. So the way it works is that when you upload a file to the repository, which is intralibrary, which we just call explore internally, the video file itself is sent to Kaltura through its API. Kaltura returns a reference to that file so that Moodle or the Moodle plugin now knows where that video file is, how to get it back. And then that information, the, the pointer to the video, along with the title of the video, the description, and how we want to categorize it, all that information is sent off to the repository. So the repository holds the link to the Kaltura video along with its metadata and so that it's searchable and discoverable. But the video file itself is in Kaltura. Um, one of the limitations of Kaltura, good as it is, and there are Moodle plugins for Kaltura. So if you just want to use Kaltura, there are Moodle plugins that will integrate directly with it and allow you to get the transcoding side of it working. But the limitation of it is that by default, Kaltura only allows you to see videos that you've uploaded, so you can't share them easily. You can quite easily get around that by modifying the plugin code to say that it's so that it doesn't use the logged in user's ID, it uses a common ID, but then it doesn't really have ways to search. The search for videos isn't great, you can't put them into categories. So what we did initially, when we first put Kaltura in, it was on that basis, it was using Kaltura's direct Moodle integration. We didn't have a repository at that time. So we were already using Kaltura at the point we came to get a repository system. So you don't need the two. You can put Kaltura in on its own. And I would strongly recommend you look at doing that if, you, if you're having the kind of issues where you were with video. Sorry, I'm not sure if I've just skipped a slide there. A bit sticky. The number's changing, but the slide's not for some reason. Hold on. Okay, so I don't think I've missed anything there. Sorry, the uh, navigation on the slides got a bit sticky. Um, the big one for us has always been this sort of course management um, side of things. This is always the biggest thing to get a, a grip on again because Moodle grew on, a, on an ad hoc basis from the bottom up, very much ground up. Um, and in in fact, nobody really, I don't think anybody at a senior level really appreciated how important Moodle had become until we ran into performance problems a, a couple of years back. And then I, I think that was a bit of a wake-up call to a lot of people um, 
because it caused a massive amount of upset and frustration. Um, and it was really since that happened that there's been kind of a bit more investment into Moodle. I think one of the problems with doing things ground up and doing things cheaply is that, you know, so it kind of creates a perception, oh, Moodle's free. Um, the servers aren't free, but it's certainly cheap compared to co commercial alternatives. And, it, you know, my perception of things is that it, it had been perceived as a little bit as a little bit of a, a freebie. Um, right. Can you all see this slide? Open source repositories now. This is one that was skipped. Seems to be a bit of lag on this. The slide I'm looking at says open source repository, so I had actually missed a slide. Right. Yeah, well, I've missed one out, which I'm hoping you're going to be able to see in a minute. Because I had added a slide on open source repositories, which just mentions Alfresco, which you could use, and something else called CDMS. I'm going to try and get back onto that. Oh, hold on. I've skipped it back again now. Losing, I'm completely losing control of this at the moment. Very sorry. Didn't happen last time. Okay. I'm hoping that this is going to come back. This slide on open source repositories. So if you're interested in working with repositories, Alfresco is probably the best open source one, but it does run on Java and takes some setting up. Um, there are some videos on YouTube about that. So those are worth a look. It, it looks quite good. Something else which is a bit of a, a kind of a, a digression um, is that there's no open source PHP equivalents which I've always seen is a bit of a problem with this within the kind of LAMP or, you know, sort of Moodle world is that a lot of people don't really have the resources to run Java applications. And this takes quite some setting up. I came across this CDMS a while back, which it's not a full blown repository, but has enough to kind of share content. It doesn't integrate with Moodle, but I did speak to the developer of CDMS and he had actually worked on Moodle before, and I was trying to convince him to sort of add this kind of integration to CDMS. Um, so I don't know if there are enough people interested, maybe we'd make a nice little crowdfunding project, because I think for certainly in schools and smaller organizations, having something that you could deploy easily alongside Moodle on the same technology would kind of open up this kind of option to smaller organizations that don't necessarily necessarily have the resources to you know install a enterprise level java based repository but these are a couple there are options there are open source options and i think those options will increase going forward so i'm very sorry again that that slide got chopped out so if i pick this back up um as i said we only really, a lot of people only really recognized how important Moodle was when we hit performance problems. And in terms of course management, it was became impossible. Well, it was always impossible to reliably map the kind of management information system or student record system in our case to Moodle courses. The only way we ever came up with doing that was that you would get a code out of the student record system and a lecturer would manually copy and paste that back into um, Moodle's, Moodle's got an ID field in the core settings, which you may have noticed, which can be used to map it to external systems. But you can't rely on lecturers to, to do that. You know, you've got human error. Some people will forget. Some people just won't get it in the first place. So that was never going to work. When we started looking at automated solutions, the only way we could see of doing this was to provision Moodle courses through our management or information system or student record system. And 
what we're looking at doing now, and are quite far down the line with this, is to take these processes away from the Moodle interface and control them through web services, those being Moodle's web services. So course creation and rollover, so rollover are essentially what most lecturers do is back up and restore a course. So they'll take a backup of a particular course from 2013, they will restore it, they'll rename it 2014. When they, when they roll the course over or restore it, it will be without user data and they'll essentially clone the course for the following year, which I'm guessing is probably familiar to a lot of you guys. So that process we're going to take out of Moodle and automate. Well, we're not taking out of Moodle, but we're taking out of Moodle's interface. User creation is another one. Now, <clears throat> in our system, user accounts only get created when somebody logs into Moodle for the first time. And that's a problem with new students joining the university. So a lecturer who's got a list of 30 students you know, in his class or on his Moodle course, he can't actually enroll those students onto his Moodle course until they're all logged in for the first time. Um, so that means quite often that students don't get access to their Moodle course until, you know, a week or two into their degree course, which is unsatisfactory. You know, students expect to see everything they need on their first day, and, and that's what they should expect. That's what I'd expect. So Teresa saying you've got automatic course shell creation. Is that using Moosh, the Moosh plugins when you say shell? And Teresa's also saying they can't back up or restore. Okay, you've created your own scripts. Yeah, well, we'll come on to what we've created in a minute. And um, we're using web services. But yeah, this idea that staff can't back up and restore. Um, all oh, right, you create users through that. Okay. Yeah, we pull in through our single sign-on process. When somebody logs in through SSO, it checks their details, and we can pull pull student images in from the student record system. So we already pull images over, but we're doing that through the single sign-on or authentication process. So details from users get updated when they log in. So as Teresa's already just saying in the chat section here, they're, they're handling enrollment on courses, I think. So we'll be handling enrollment and unenrollment automatically, but we won't unenroll students, we'll suspend them. When you suspend a user, they, they remain in the course, but they're kind of greyed out if you look at the list of participants. The reason for that is that when you look at unenrollment, if you look at Moodle Docs around unenrollment or re-enrolling an unenrolled student, I think the wording is something like Moodle will attempt to restore all their grades and all their information. Well, attempt didn't sound very conclusive to us, and we were worried that somebody who made a mistake in the student record system, we were very concerned that a mistake made in the student record system might cause students to lose data in Moodle. So we're actually using the suspend process where they're not unenrolled from the course, but they essentially become invisible. Um, just a quick question for Teresa. I'm showing got thumbnails at the bottom of my bottom of my screen in big blue button, and I'm not sure how to get rid of them. Is there a way to me to hide those thumbnails? So the other part of this is course archiving and deletion. Oh, thanks very much for that, Teresa, sorry. So course archiving and deletion is another one. We, when we talk about course archiving, we really want to make the previous year's courses read-only, and this is largely for invigilators. So some of our courses have external accreditation attached to them. So um, I can't think of all the examples, but I know, for example, that some courses use Cisco Content. So if you're familiar with Cisco, they, ha they have a Cisco Networking Academy. Um, and some of our degree courses in incorporate kind of standard industry accreditation in into the degree courses. Well, these external organizations aren't just going to give away their own um, certification without knowing that they've been properly taught 
and so they sometimes want to come in and they typically want to look at the previous year's courses and they want to see them as they were when they were taught they want to know that they're looking at that course as it was delivered not have it potentially altered have for that course not to have been altered in this sort of intervening months so we want to make them read only so we've got kind of a snapshot of them and we want to automatically delete them and the other part of wanting to archive them or make them read only is so that we can take a backup of that course and know it hasn't changed before we delete it if courses archived or previous years courses are continually changing then you can never take a definitive backup of it um, and that can make it a bit more difficult if you want to move things off into an archived system and then delete them from live you need to know that what you've archived is a, a definitive version so that's kind of why we want to make things read only and I think the idea is that the previous years courses will be read only and maybe a couple of years before that and then after a given amount of time we'll automatically delete them yeah Teresa saying in the comments it gets tricky doesn't it and it certainly does um, Teresa's also saying we have a clean space for each year the trouble is getting staff to leave them alone well I don't know if by clean space you mean a fresh Moodle install because I know some schools take that approach um, for us that's not really viable students are with us for three years they want to be able to refer back to their old grades and also years tend to build upon each other so particular topics you know you may start a course and there'll be four modules you'll have level one level two level three level four and level one and two are taught in year one level three and four would be taught in year two or perhaps it may be level one might be taught in year two level three and four in year two so because courses are building you know there's kind of this incremental development across the the different modules it's important for students to be able to retain access to their previous Moodle courses forum discussions things that they were taught so if we do that we we really want to keep all that in one system so that students can easily refer back to things that they saw previously or were taught previously yeah so Teresa is also saying they use the same Moodle site but an empty course that they can import to from last time well this is what we do but instead of creating an empty course and importing what we tend to or what our academics tend to do is back up the current course without user data so if you go into Moodle's course backup you can back up without user data then restore the course with a new name without user data and then edit it so so Teresa saying we don't trust our staff to do that our staff do that they're competent enough to do that but it's a painful process when you do backup restore it will lock your browser session um, if you've got a lot of files in it can get sticky it's it's a painful process for, for lecturers and it happens at the busiest time of year um, but that's our process so I'll kind of wrap this slide up we're actually going to remove these capabilities from staff in future or from the standard Moodle teacher role or course creator and we will create new roles for anything that's ad hoc um, that doesn't fit within this system so generic courses like research skills which are used and not directly tied to the student record system they will always be managed in Moodle but all of the um, sort of structured courses that are built around modules in the student record system will be removing capabilities from those roles in Moodle because we need everything to follow a consistent process because that's the only way we know that we'll get the, the data we need to integrate um, the slide you're looking at now should say course management process I hope that's the one you can all see okay so what this is showing here is a lecturer and something called course port or your course portal it's gone by different names which is making things a little bit confusing along the way so your course is what students and staff will call the course portal that's the name it's being given and this is a web interface that's part of our university portal 
this is our student record system sits and there's already an existing service here that monitors changes in this system so students being enrolled um, and being added or removed from added to or removed from their taught modules and so there's this this service that can monitor changes and what will happen is that both staff and students have access to your course but as you would as you'd expect the lecturer or the module leader specifically has access to some admin functions and he or she can initiate a course duplication request which is going to roll over the course because Moodle backup and restores the time-consuming process this isn't triggered autom automatically sorry it's triggered automatically but it's not done on the fly it goes into a queuing system and these will run overnight because backup and restore also puts some strain on the system so we'll run that overnight to try and avoid any performance impact during the day and then there's this service here which will queue these jobs up and it will send a course duplication request to Moodle that will verify that course has been duplicated and get the details of the course back and then all of the users who are already on the module over here will be enrolled so if there are already 20 students enrolled on that module they will automatically be enrolled once that course has been created but any subsequent changes so if a student's added or removed here afterwards so maybe the following day two more students are added to that module and one is removed from it that information runs through this system very quickly um, so that, that those changes then aren't queued up it's only the course duplication that runs on this kind of overnight scheduling and everything else happens pretty much real time including managing teachers that being assigning or removing editing or non editing teachers to the Moodle course so the individual that administers this is the module leader um, who is the lecturer responsible for that course but quite often lecturers work in teams so there will be one person who's the module leader on one course and then they have two or three colleagues working with them on that particular course and somebody else will be module leader on a different course that they will all participate in but it's the module leader that's defined in this system that initiates this process and manages the teachers right I'm afraid it's happened again I've just clicked on to the next slide and it's got stuck sorry about this sorry 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 This is really odd. There's one slide it seems to be sticking on. What do you mean by you have courses starting at different times that start at any one point? I'm just looking back at an out of pre oh, sorry Jeremy that was um that was when you were talking about some institutions having a completely different Moodle site for each uh, year okay. um, and or or yeah for each sort of yeah for each year I suppose or, or intake of students but there's no way we can do that because ours ours will start and stop at different times or that we have set semesters but we have other ones that sort of go over those dates so so that's why we have the same course a uh, same site and we just get it you know got automated empty courses created so right. um yeah and then we just have a we've got an automated script that moves um old courses so um i think at the moment we've got the last four years in our site so anything older than that gets put into a category which is then um, scripted to be backed up 
um, for archive and deleted off the site. But then we also have additional um, snapshot backups, which which seems a bit overboard, but those are the ones that I can easily restore because they're the Moodle course backups. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. I think I get what you're saying, <laughs> but it does get um, does get a bit complicated how you can kind of manage this, how you can manage this clear down. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to skip one of these slides, which is a real nuisance, but I just can't get it to load. Um, do, you want me to, do you want me to have a go, Jeremy? What's the name of the slide? Hold on a moment. I think it's number 24. Okay, just a second then. It's a brownie coloured slide. A bit peculiar because, um, yeah, because um, use this same PDF file in the, in the last presentation. I can carry on without it. It's, it's a bit of an annoyance. It's the next slide on from this one. Is it creating a Moodle course? Yeah. Oh, we had that one. Brownie coloured one. Yeah, that's it. We've got it. Can oh, you not right. see that one? No, I can't. I'm still looking at the previous one. Oh. So what you should be, hold on, I'm just going to go and get my, um, go back into my Moodle course and dig this out. Actually, I think it's nearly there. Can everybody else, can everybody else see creating a Moodle course as the slide? I've got that one. It should say creating a Moodle course and it's kind of a, a brownie coloured um, slide and the header says RAD 5010 Academic and Professional Practice. Is that the one that you're looking at? Okay, so it's just my PC. I'm sorry, I, I'm on less than great PC at the moment and I was on a nice fast one earlier. So what this screen is showing is within the course portal then the purpose of the course portal is to give students an overview of their degree course so they'll see all their modules as they progress from year to year, they'll see all their grades, they'll see all their assignment deadlines and various other bits of information coming out of different systems, be that the student record system or Moodle and really a, a management tool of sorts for students. Um, they had something like this when I did my degree course and I found it invaluable because I was always aiming for a certain mark and so I would track my grades from module to module and see what I would need on the remaining modules to achieve what I wanted to on that course and it was great to be able, you know, the timetable was in there for your taught lectures and you had everything in one place. So that was the purpose of this system and for us it, it then gave us the opportunity to do the Moodle integration. So most of this system was being built anyway and the guys who are writing this added this kind of Moodle integration onto that. So what you can see there is um, a Moodle sort of icon and it says Moodle towards the button and status, it says not set up and there's a button there to create Moodle course. And I'm not sure, I think I've just been able to move that slide along now. So can you see the slide choosing existing course slash template to copy? You see that, Theresa, or? Yep, okay, so when you click that button, when you click um, create Moodle course, this is, it's kind of um, a pop-up window comes up and it says find a Moodle course to clone and it's Ajax based, so as the module leader types in the name of the course, it starts querying Moodle to get back the list of to find the existing Moodle course that you want to copy. Now as you can see there, this is all test information, it's coming out of a test Moodle instance, but what you're looking at there are Moodle courses. And we will always duplicate a course, never create one from scratch. Um, 
And in the instance that somebody is creating a new Moodle course, what they will use is a template. So if you're starting from scratch, you would choose to clone a particular template that will be perhaps pre-populated with some information on how the course should be structured. And once you've chosen the course, so we should now be on another slide, check course details and then clone. If we're not, please let me know. So what that page then shows is, no, it's not just a list of their courses, it's a list of all courses. Um, and there's a reason for that, which is that, as I mentioned earlier, lecturers work in teams and they may have different roles across different courses that they teach. So you could have four, four lecturers teaching four Moodle courses with a different module leader on each of them, but they all work, you know, the module leader on one may be acting in a supporting role on another, if that makes sense. Um, no, you can, they won't have editing rights on other courses, so they can duplicate a course they don't have editing rights. They would only have editing rights on the course that they duplicated then. Um, but we're not locking it down. I mean, actually, a big problem. It's not a big problem. It, it's a big. It's a big problem if it affects you. Is when staff leave the university, it can be you know difficult for them to find things. But um, sorry, the the my course material. You mean that they wouldn't, don't, I don't quite understand what you mean. I think my view on this, and it might, it might differ drastically to a lecturer's view, is that the university owns this content, owns these Moodle courses. Um, lecturers have been paid to produce it. Um, and so we, we don't, lock that down. We, we don't allow lecturers to go in and edit each other's courses, but if somebody needs to roll something over and reuse it, if there's something similar, if there's something that exists that's 50% similar to what they want to do, they should be able to take that, use it, repurpose it, republish it. Um, it's not everyone's view, but to be honest, this system wouldn't work for us if we tried to lock it down on that, on that basis people move around. We're in, in the middle, actually, of quite a significant reorganization at the moment. People's roles change. People leave the university. Um, and to be honest, I mean, you know, generally, people are trustworthy and, you know, and also have actually very little interest in going in and rolling over an irrelevant course. <laughs> I mean, why? Actually, there is um, something else to this which is that only the module leader can go in and create the Moodle course for that record in the student record system. If they, and they can only roll over one course per SITS module. So there's no way that they're going to go in and deliberately roll over an irrelevant course just so they can look at it because all their students will be enrolled on the wrong content, if that makes sense. So um, it isn't actually a problem, although you can search everything module leaders are going to be pretty sure to, to roll over the correct course and that will invari invari sorry, invariably be something that they've taught or worked on before. So this information here, they, they choose the course they want to roll over or duplicate. This is the Moodle category which they have the ability to change. So if they're categorizing things for different year groups, they can change this category but by default it will choose by default, it will go back into the category that the parent course came from. Gives you the Moodle ID, course ID, the full name, the short name, which these will be auto-generated based on information in our student record system as well. Category ID and the course summary. So this is also coming out of Moodle. In fact, everything here is Moodle, essentially. So the next slide that you should be looking at now is course create process. As I mentioned earlier, this runs on an overnight job. And so when a lecturer or a module leader first initiates this process, for the rest of that day, it's going to show in this pending status because it hasn't been built in Moodle. It's going to show them the link to the course that they're cloning or the, the original course that they chose to roll over and copy. 
so they can click through on that link and check it's the right one that assumes that they've got access to that course in Moodle they've got teaching rights on it so again if they click on that and they find that they they can't access it they might realize perhaps they've chosen the wrong course and if they do realize they've made a mistake at this point they can click the little red X and that will just delete that job from the queue they can go back in and, and start again and choose a different Moodle course to clone because at this point nothing's actually happened in Moodle but overnight when the course is duplicated then the status will change and it will look like this so the following day if the module leader goes in they will see this view which actually shows them now the Moodle course so this is now their Moodle course the new Moodle course which was based on this one so these are two different Moodle courses this is the new one and then they also get shown the teachers which I think they're going to change this term to tutor I think for us in Moodle referring to teachers never made sense in a university but it became so established and ingrained we left it like that but I think they're going to actually change this to tutors and it will show one name here which is the name of the module leader who rolled this course over so when it's first copied the only editing teacher is the person that initiated this process but there's a link here to manage this Moodle course you should see a slide now that says adding users um, and that's exactly what it does so now the module leader can search for users within the system um, and these don't necessarily I think this is coming out of a different system actually to Moodle I'm imagining this is probably coming out of the staff directory um, but they can again as they type it will start to automatically bring up the list of users they choose who they want to add this is a beta version there will be another drop down here that says the role that you want to assign be that teacher non-editing teacher and when they've found that somebody they click to add them as you can see here they have the ability to remove them so this is where they would assign the teaching staff and this runs straight through this runs straight through into Moodle it's a direct link so as you make changes here they are almost instantly appear in Moodle and students are added and removed automatically based on the student record system so this is only used to, to update the teaching staff so the oh, I'm sorry there's something else I should have mentioned earlier there is a, actually a sort of five minute video walkthrough of everything I've shown here which if you're interested you can kind of just see a little video demo of that on a beta system so the benefits of this for us in 2014 because this is kind of a phased rollout we haven't finished it all yet would be the automated rollover and course creation automatic student enrollments and the real sort of big win I think for everybody is that the first time a student ever logs into Moodle or visits my Moodle everything's there I believe that this will also increase the use of Moodle because it becomes part of a workflow um, you know there are still some courses that don't have a corresponding Moodle module which is something that you know, is being encouraged with you know the academic staff driving this have for a long time said that every six module should have a Moodle course associated with it um, but it's always really relied on the kind of goodwill or relied on lecturers wanting to do that whereas now it becomes very much more of a part of a workflow there's a button there that says create your Moodle course um, so we think that that will kind of move us on a, a little bit more in terms of using Moodle course documents can also be linked um, so the course portal stores documents in SharePoint things like module guides assignment briefs and typically they then get downloaded and uploaded back into Moodle so that duplicates documents it makes managing them harder sometimes a module guide may be corrected and updated in SharePoint and they'll forget to re-upload it into Moodle um, so we will keep one copy of these documents and we're writing a, a block for Moodle and the Moodle block will show the photo of the module leader of their contact details it will have 
um, direct links into the module guide, assignment briefs, we'll have a direct link back to the course portal page for that module. So we're sort of hoping over time to sort of make this integration much tighter between the two systems. And then kind of over the next year, <coughs> so we'll roll that out for the next enrollment period, which will be September 2014. That will be kind of used for the first time with an intake of new students. And then beyond that, we're going to work on things like the automated archiving, deletion, clearing down of expired users. Um, the next big one is integrating assignments and grading. And integrating assignments is very difficult because not all assignments are actually graded and assessed. Some are used formatively. Um, so that students upload pieces of work and get feedback on it and go take it away and work on it. So the kind of offline process where a student might go to a lecturer with a printed copy and say, you know, could you have a look at this, give me some feedback on it. All that's starting to go through Moodle. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'll wrap this up now. Um, so integrating assignments is another one, getting automated grades out. Analytics is another big one, identifying students who are struggling and we can combine Moodle data with attendance information, things coming out of Mahara. All this kind of analytics stuff is quite important. Um, and all of this, everything we've shown you around Moodle integration has been made possible by web services. So if you check this page, or Google Moodle Web Services Roadmap. You can see Moodle's got 84 web service functions, and I think we're only using five or six for everything that we've done. It supports multiple protocols, and this really makes everything that I've shown in the previous slides possible. It's uh, been a massive leap forward to us, particularly some new web services that came in in Moodle 2.5, I think, which we needed. Um, and without these web services, we wouldn't have been able to to do all this stuff. And I'll put this slide in because I've quite often seen on Moodle.org people critical of, of Moodle HQ saying, why have you invested all this time in building web services nobody uses when you could be building something else instead? Well, we're using web services and, and anybody who wants to integrate management information systems, if you're working in a school and your district wants information on how your schools performing, then these web services really open up a world of possibilities for you in terms of integrating. So they are very useful. Um, and so to summarize um, our kind of journey, you know, when we started in 2003, nobody really knew where Moodle would lead. It was a new product at that time. And allowing it to grow organically had its benefits, low cost being one of them. And we were only buying hardware in line demand with demand. But as I touched on earlier, that kind of created a perception that Moodle was free or cheap, didn't really need any investment. And that really um, caught up with us at one point a couple of years ago. So if you're starting out with Moodle, um, you should try and get a decent amount of funding for it, really. And it's still very cheap compared to commercial alternatives. And the other thing is that trying to introduce these core of Control structures or integration retrospectively is very difficult. And the earlier you can kind of look at this side of it, if it's something you want to do, the easier it becomes, particularly when it comes to asking people to change their working practices. So, you know, we are now asking people to change the way they're doing something after, or the way they've been doing something for 10 years, you know. That's a particular problem in terms of sharing content, asking people, you know, share your resources that they've spent many hours on and, you know, don't necessarily want to do that. So if you're able to plan and, and fund a more structured approach, I think it certainly pays off in the long term. And I think it's a lot easier to do that now than it was in 2003 because there are more precedents out there. Um, in terms of what other people are doing with Moodle. And I think it's easier to get a picture of where you might want to go, certainly easier than it was in 2003 when everybody was kind of brand new to it. So I'm sorry if that ran over, and I'm very sorry for the, the sticky slideshow, but I sort of hope that was useful. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any more questions on this. And if anybody wants to turn their mic on. 
Oh, thank you very much, Jeremy. I know I could probably sit here for another hour and, and um, carry on. I've probably held up your session mostly with all my chat session, actually. Um, I think we have a lot in common with what we're doing, um, you know, your institution and mine, actually, which is what um, what's exciting me about this session. So um, I also apologise for probably being the student that's holding up the lecturer. <laughs> um, but again... If anyone has any questions, um, we've, we've probably got a couple of minutes. Before, you know, we've, the next session starts in ten. Um, Jeremy's also got a discussion forum, of course, as as all of them do in his IMOOC space. So um, there's um, a thread in there that you can um, ask some questions. And um, thank you also, Jeremy, for putting all those beautiful resources into your course. So thanks yeah, again. Most of what I've discussed, there are sort of some some videos and some other documents in the Moodle course, and there is a forum in there if anybody wants to ask anything. So if there's anything that sort of caught your interest, I've tried to provide more information on that for you if you want to look at it. I don't know. Has anybody got anything they they want to ask? Oh, thanks, Anna. All right, thanks, David. Thanks. I think the other thing that would interest me, actually, Theresa, I think you said you were working with a school district. I think one of the most interesting things I've seen a district do with Moodle was to set up a repository and have teachers in different, this is a content repository, and, and they also had a Moodle hub set up where um, teachers in different schools teaching the same subject in the same year group would collaborate to build their Moodle courses. And then, and I'm talking about, I think maybe 180 schools were kind of linked up in this way. Um, and so you can imagine perhaps five teachers collaborating on a, on a Moodle course that they could then be pulled back down by maybe 20 other teachers who would repurpose it. Um, and that kind of thing would apply also to sort of management information systems. I mean, I know in this country we've got there's an organization called Ofsted, which is kind of a government organization interested in school standards. And increasingly, they ask teachers to spend their time bean counting and testing kids instead of teaching them. And if you're using Moodle, you can kind of teach and test and measure at the same time and, and kind of get a bit more value out of that process and simply getting kids in a room with bits of paper. And if you're working in a district, then using Moodle web services to pull out this kind of standard information that you need, I would imagine, is also um, of value. I know that there's a Moodle partner in the UK that's quite big on that. And when they go out and deploy Moodle, they have this kind of uh, MIS integration there for that very reason, because I, my understanding of it, I don't work in what we call primary education. Um, but my understanding is that that can save teachers a lot of time, a lot of paperwork, um, to better use of Moodle, or a good use of Moodle web services, perhaps. Yeah, Teresa's saying collaboration with business degree program. We sort of collaborate with external organizations. We've got a separate Moodle for that that doesn't require SSO, um, doesn't require a university account. Um, so ad hoc short courses, things like that, we've got a, another Moodle set up for that. I think the, another interesting thing in terms of collaborating with external organizations, the video, some of the videos that I linked in my Moodle course here on iMoot, I actually uploaded through our Moodle system, put them in our repository. And so the Kaltura video is embedded in, in the iMoot space for this presentation. I uploaded through 
our Moodle system and I'm able to just get them out, paste them back in here and reuse them. And we're also sort of looking at trying to hook things like WordPress up with it because we use WordPress and blogs. And uh, if you kind of, once you start integrating stuff, life can become a lot easier. And, and it's quite an interesting area, really. Moodle historically was quite encapsulated, I think, certainly the older versions. And I think HQ or Martin Dugiamis have really recognized the fact that you, know, you Moodle can kind of be a hub at the centre of something broader, and it's very much gone in that direction, I think. 51 areas that you can extend through plugins, I believe, and 84 web services. You can, this so wasn't that hard to, hard to do. So yeah, it's interesting. So Teresa, I don't know, has anybody got any questions or do you want to wrap it up? Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, I think we'll wrap it up now. We've um, we've not got long before the next session. So thanks again, Jeremy. That was very interesting for me and I'm sure the others got a lot out of it as well. Um, and remember the resources are there, yeah. Well, thanks for salvaging me when my slides got stuck. So. <laughs> That helped a lot. No problem. No worries. Okay, I'm going to head out and um, into the next room. So um, have a great iMoot, and um, I might catch up with you another day, Jeremy. Yep, okay. Thanks, Gina. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. And I uh, hope to see you in another session or two later on. So, okay, then. Bye, everyone.